Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can all hear me again. Uh, I hope you've had a chance to refresh and have some lunch. Um, and we're going to kick off with the afternoon session now. Uh, this is session three uh, for the afternoon. And uh, in front of you, you'll see our programme for this afternoon. We've got a number of speakers. This uh, the early part of the afternoon focuses on disease control with a number of our CTP students. And then we'll also be looking at some other futuristic issues, such as seaweed and biostimulants and irrigation. Um, we'll be looking at year-round production of UK strawberries, Coir and re its recycling. And then we'll finish the afternoon with two well-known faces, Adam Whitehouse, who will give us an update on the East Morning Strawberry Breeding Club, and Mark Else, who will talk to us about results from this year's wet centre. So kicking off with Matteo Luberti. Um, Matteo is another of our CTP students. For those of you that were with us this morning, you will know that, uh, I, what the CTP stands for, Collaboration Training Partnership. And Matteo is, has been doing some work on both apple and strawberry. He's talked to the tree fruit industry about his work on Phytophthora cactorum for them. And this afternoon, he's going to talk to us about uh, the work he's doing on strawberry Phytophthora cactorum or crown rot, as it's better known to most of you. Good afternoon, Matteo. Good afternoon, Scott. Good to be here. Um, Hopefully you can see me and hear me. We can see you. We can't see yeah. your presentation yet. So hopefully that yeah. will come up. It's here we are. Perfect. We're ready now. There Thank we are. You very much. Uh, you're welcome. So welcome everybody and good afternoon. As Scott said, I'll be talking about my work uh, focusing on the strawberry side of things. Um, and I'd like to start my presentations with the horrible pictures of the diseased plants and fruits, just as a reminder of what we're up against, um, although I probably don't have to remind any of you. So uh, Phytophthora is a pathogenic homicide that causes disease in over 160 plant hosts. So it's got a very, very wide uh, host range, which makes it very challenging to control. And this includes very many horticultural uh, crops, including strawberry, uh, but also raspberries and many other commercially important ones. Um, in strawberry in particular, it can cause uh, crown rot, but it can also affect the fruit, although this is not um, as prevalent in the UK, but it results in complete plant wilt, uh, which you can see on the right-hand side. Um, Any in substantially, um, commercially relevant losses to the industry. This is particularly bad um, for Phytophthora because it produces two different types of, of spores. Uh, ooze spores, which persist in the soil uh, and in um, growing media for several years. Um, and there are really no uh, control measures for this. And zoospores, which can um, propagate through production systems, uh, through irrigation and water, um, which again can affect the plant and the production system at all stages. Um, and as I said, it can be very, very hard to control and very expensive as well uh, for soil systems, which are not as uh, prevalent in the UK. Um, the only real um, control measures are is soil fumigation, which has been almost completely phased out. And um, many chemicals every year are phased out, uh, but also using resistant plants, which is what I'm advocating for, um, can cut your um, expenses in terms of applications, buying the chemicals and the machines that are needed to apply them. So it can be very advantageous to use uh, resistant stock and clean nursery stock uh, for that. So the aims of my research um, are really understanding what the genetic resistant um, traits look like, uh, what these plants um, look like, how they are resistant and why, and how to make that resistance as durable as we can. Uh, in, commercially, in commercial production systems, the, the pathogen are under very severe selection pressure, which pushes them towards evolving and overcoming the resistance that we put um, into our plants, but also resistance to the chemicals that we use. 
uh, and this can be more challenging um, for the breeding programs because the resistance markers are not always located within the gene responsible for that resistance or in the uh, biological mechanism that is um, responsible for that resistance then, that we then observe. So identifying the gene itself and the mechanism that is responsible for it can be advantageous uh, so that we can understand where and when this resistance is occurring. So how do we go about it? Um, I have to mention that this uh, project was started during the um, as, as a part of the IDRIS project. So the data that I analyzed was produced before I even started my PhD, which was fantastic for me because it meant that I could push further during my project. So during that um, project, they selected two um, varieties, one resistant, Fenella, uh, and one extremely susceptible, Emily, which you can hopefully see from the pictures. These had been inoculated and the pictures had been taken four weeks after. So you can see that Emily has completely gone while Fenella is almost completely uh, resistant, though it does show some traits. So um, I, as I said, I was able to analyze the transcriptome uh, of these two plants after they had been inoculated in a sterile setup that you can see from the pictures here. Um, so we did this, they did this um, in a sterile environment to ensure that what we're looking at is the response to uh, fight off inoculation and not anything else that might have been present on the plant or on the medium that we were growing them on. Um, and so we selected two time points, 12 hours and 48 hours after inoculation to look at the very, very early response of the plant and uh, a bit further. And this was also done so that we could get the data for Phytophthora as well. So what this graph uh, hopefully shows clearly is that we get a very strong response to the inoculation of um, these two plants at 48 hours. Um, both in Emily and Fenella. And hopefully you can see that there is a uh, substantial variation between the two varieties as well. Um, but it is also important to remember that the genes that are expressed between uh, zero and 12 hours are also important, even though there's less of them, because they, um, they may be responsible for the very first step of the inoculation. So, there's quite a few genes that are involved in this. And as we, have, and as we could expect, um, many of them are involved in the resistant mechanism. So the next step for me is um, looking at the great number of genes that are differentially expressed and trying to narrow down and see which ones are associated with resistance and which ones have a role in this resistant mechanism. Um, so I do this in several ways. And unfortunately, I don't have a straightforward answer for you yet. Um, but I have several interesting candidates um, that, I, that I found looking at genes that have um, resistance associated uh, motifs in their um, genomic sequence, and also looking at the expression uh, and how it looks between resistant and susceptible plants. So for instance, a gene that was uh, upregulated in the resistant variety might indicate that um, that gene is being employed by the resistant plant to overcome the, res uh, the infection. And so the future of this work is narrowing down it further by looking at um, what has been previously annotated in other plant uh, systems, for instance, and then get independent validation of the experimental um, candidates that we have from the transcriptum. And finally, the aim really is to get um, improved markers that the breeding programs can put in the new lines um, and get beautiful strawberries like the ones that you can see in these pumpnets. 
So to conclude, I'd like to thank um, my supervisors, Charlotte Nellis, Jim Dunwell, um, everybody at NIAB really, um, Feli, um, but also everybody else that's involved with my project and everybody else that asks questions in the corridors, as well as the founders that makes, uh, make this work possible at all. Uh, and you for listening. I'll take any questions if you have any, and but if you want to email me, it's at the bottom of the slide. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Matteo. Um, I suppose the obvious question is, uh, or which perhaps you've um, perhaps you've already answered it, is uh, that we'll, how, how quickly will this type of work be taken up by the Strawberry Breeding Club, Adam and his and his colleagues at East Malling? So this is very. It's still preliminary work. As I said, I don't have an answer for you to, uh, to implement a single gene that I can put in the breeding program. But hopefully by the end of this PhD, we'll have a pool of candidates that we can then assess and get uh, in the breeding program. But it's a few years still. Good. OK. Thank you, Matteo. Um, I should just say at this point um, that uh, we, we have asked all of the students just to give a short 10 minute presentations. Um, one of the reasons we've packed so many talks into this event today has been on the basis that the less you hear, the more you remember. And uh, so thank you to Matteo for being uh, succinct, keeping it short and to the point, and hopefully people will remember the information that you've been uh, disseminating today. Thank you, Matteo. Um, thank you very we're much. Now going to Thank you very much. We're now going to move on to another CTP student. And I'm hoping that we will be able to see Samantha Lynn, who is, uh, has been working on powdery mildew resistance. Um, we are just transferring now, I think. Um, yes. Yeah, here Use we go. Screen. We are, we are sorted out. We just had a few technical hitches there, but we've managed to get Samantha and uh, your presentation. Um, yes, yeah, so just to, just to um, introduce Samantha, um, I think it's worth saying at this point that strawberry powdery mildew uh, has been a massive, massive problem for the, or for the strawberry industry for probably the best part of 25 years. When I started in the industry way back in about 1990, everybody was uh, wiped out by botrytis and then we started using polytunnels and bang, the botrytis decreased and strawberry powdery mildew increased and we've never quite sorted out a simple, easy way to resolve the problem. So we're hoping that some of the work that Samantha's doing is going to do that for us. So the floor is yours, Samantha. Thank you. Uh, so my project is identifying novel powdery mildew susceptibility and resistant genes in strawberry. So uh, powdery mildew is uh, a global problem on strawberry and the observed symptoms uh, can be uh, noticeable powdery white mycelium growth on the leaves and the fruit, as well as um, leaf curling and uh, discoloured patches. Discoloured patches. Infection of the powdery mildew can affect the strawberry development, and this can lead to the, the severe yield loss due to unmarketable fruits. Now, current commercial control of the disease is through the use of fungicidal sprays. However, there are concerns of insensitivity and resistance to this method, which is why an alternative solution to the problem is required. Focusing on a resistant cultivar offers the most favorable solution to reduce the impact of the powdery mildew. To just give you a, an overall view of my project and be um, planting a, a large range of different cultivars within the field and be extracting DNA and putting them on a SNP chip for genotyping, as well as uh, phenotyping the disease. And this will also be done using a drone. And it will be the genotype and phenotype uh, information that can be put into a genome-wide association study, which will then identify uh, genes of interest that are associated with powdery mildew. And these genes of interest can then be deleted. And this will be done by uh, producing a construct to delete the gene, which will be inserted into agrobacterium. And this can be um, transformed into strawberry. Then once the strawberries have grown, they can then be, uh, the gene function can be validated by pathogenicity tests. And this will also incorporate uh, several different um, imaging techniques. So the project that I'm working on actually has uh, three sections. 
So a uh, work package one is a functional validation of candidate susceptibility factors. Work package two is the GWAS mildew field, field experiment. And um, work package three is a controlled pathogenicity inoculations. So uh, during my literature review, uh, we found uh, two strawberry genes of interest, which are associated with facilitating the powdery mildew infection. And these are susceptibility genes, uh, MLO, mildew resistant loci zero, MLO genes. And these MLO genes can be found in many crops, such as wheat, peach, barley, and can be involved with different tissues. Now, one way in which the MLO genes can cause a susceptibility in the host plant is when they're actually switched on, they affect the cytoskeleton, and this can allow the powdery, mini, powdery mildew to infect the cell wall and actually infect the host. And studies have shown that natural mutations in the MLO gene can prompt the loss of function and therefore lead to a more a resistant cultivar. Now, in uh, the diploid uh, model for Garia Vesca, there have been uh, 20 MLO genes identified, and 68 have been identified in the commercial octoploid for Garia NASA. And in a comparative analysis with these two genes, compared with the known strawberry genome uh, Camarosa, and the diploid subvarieties showed that the, this, these two genes have a 90 to 97% conservation within the gene. So therefore these make it good candidates for gene deletion. So using the CRISPR-Cas system, which is the best known method for gene editing, the CRISPR-Cas uh, genetic editing approach modifies the genome at site specific, uh, through site, di site directed deletion. And the site of cutting is directed by a designed single guided RNA, whereby the Cas9 generates a double stranded break which then induces uh, a repair. This pet repair is very error prone. And th that this is what causes uh, mutation and therefore uh, loss of function of the gene. So at the moment, uh, constructs are being assembled to transform into, the straw into selected strawberries to in inactivate these two genes of interest. And I'm gonna be putting them into varieties Happel, which is chosen because it's no susceptibility to mildew infection and Calypso, which is known for its high transformation rate. The aim is to produce a resistant uh, genotype, which will later be validated by pathogenicity tests. So for my second work package, I'm going to be doing a genome-wide association mildew field experiment. So, in, in conjunction with the Strawberry Breeding Club, this work package entails a field experiment which includes 350 uh, different strawberry cultivars with five, rep five replicates. And these will be, have been planted in a randomized design, as well as uh, including uh, strawberry cultivars that have been infected with mildew to make sure inoculation is within the field. And so the first year was planting them in a randomized design, and this was completed in August. So for year two, this year, I have been uh, phenotyping the leaves of all these uh, strawberry cultivars. And in year three, I will also be including the strawberry flowers and fruit to identify any differences in tissue infection. The effect assessment is evaluated by scoring a disease severity. And once the data has been collected, a genome-wide association study will combine both the phenotypic and genotypic data to identify genes associated with the powdery mildew disease to identify any novel or susceptible resistance genes. And this will also be including work with their multispectral imaging, and this will be completed by using a drone. And I'll have more information on that for next year. This year, I did my assessment and I was uh, using a five point scale, which is the, symptom, uh, the Simpson scale. And you can see uh, this picture is a nice healthy leaf, shows no symptoms, but when you see the powdery mildew, you can see a uh, curling of the leaves and discolored patches. And so when I was um, scoring in the field this year, you can see in July, um, there's not a large amount of symptoms expressed in the field. This was probably due to a, a very slow, cold start of the year. But after the hot weather came in, there's a significant shift between powdery mildew presence within the field with over 50% of the cultivars showing uh, powdery mildew symptoms. 
And looking at um, statistical analysis, it's just a very significant genetic component, which is influencing the powdery mildew infection. So with my, my third pro project that I'm looking at is looking at more uh, tissue specificity. And I've been looking at the powdery mildew on different tissue types of known resistant and susceptibility, susceptible cultivars to identify any early in, infection traits and differences. So looking at these is a controlled experiment with a known amount of powdery mildew expressed on each leaf. And you, when I found when I've done this, I found that the cultivar one had more susceptibility to the powdery mildew infection than the other two. And so this is be a good way to investigate powdery mildew on tissue specificity and looking on leaves and on fruit and just to see identifying any early infection traits. I will also be using various different um, imaging techniques with these, with the hyperspectral camera and fluorescence and thermal to look at all these uh, early infection traits. So with my project in the future, I, I've been looking for my, my gene editing. I will be transforming them into the strawberries and to validate the gene function with the pathogenesis tests. Uh, with my, my second uh, work package, I will be doing the phenotyping with the drone next year uh, and looking at also the flowers and the fruit. And then I will be doing a comprehensive um, phenotyping pathogenicity experiments on a whole range of known uh, varieties to look at um, the powdery mildew infection. And thank you for listening and thank you for my supervisors, Helen Cockerton and, and Professor Dunwell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samantha. That was uh, fantastic. You're obviously managing to pack a huge amount into your uh, your studies here, um, and it's all very exciting for the future. Um, there has been a bit of chat going on, um, and um, you'll be pleased to hear, Sam, that uh, both Dan Sargent, Head of Genetics at NIIBMR, and Adam Whitehouse, Head of the Strawberry Breeding Team, have come to your aid. Um, somebody's asked about whether uh, this technology is considered GMO, and uh, I'm told that as it's presented here, yes, but it is possible to do this work uh, GMO free. Uh, and uh, also uh, Adam has added in that uh, it's a gene editing approach and is only being used for proof of gene function here. So um, hopefully that answers suitably. Um, so it's very kind of your senior colleagues to take, yes, the, uh, thank you. <laughs> take the heat off you. <laughs> um, thank you, yes. But I, I think it's amazing what all you CTP students are packing in. Uh, and uh, thank you for sharing so succinctly with us what you're, you're doing. Um, and we'll hear a bit more from Adam later on in the afternoon uh, about what all this means for the Strawberry Breeding Club itself. Sam, thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, and thank we you. will move on. Um, Lauren Farwell is our next presenter. And now I should just say um, I'm, I'm getting rather old because I remember some 30 years ago as a young advisor working for ADAS, um, going out to visit a, a raspberry grower who was growing Glen Moy in fixed tunnels um, somewhere near Sittingbourne and seeing this uh, horrible little green black mold uh, around the circumference of, or around the, around the, the lip of the, the raspberry fruits. And he didn't know what it was and I wasn't sure what it was. Um, but what I did know was that he had closed tunnels and his ventilation wasn't very good and it was horribly warm and humid inside. Um, and I took the fruit back to Angela Berry, who's a pathologist well known to most of the industry. And she looked at it and said, yeah, it's cladosporium. So that was my first experience of cladosporium. And the answer to uh, everybody was, you really need to improve your ventilation and reduce humidity. Um, so uh, as, as way of an introduction, hopefully, Lauren, that will help you. So tell us all about your studies and what you're doing to try and resolve the problem of cladosporium on raspberries. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me fine? I can. Thank you, Lauren. That's great. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, like you said, my name's Lauren Farwell. I'm based at NIBMR and I work with the University of Cranfield and I'm working on the epidemiology and management of cladosporium on raspberries. And like Scott said, uh, before it wasn't really a well-known pathogen, but it can clearly cause some really horrible lesions on your fruit, like shown on screen. So you get these horrible green lesions where it's sporulating. And actually, it can be quite a prevalent disease. So one farm in Kent found that actually over 50% of their fruit post-harvest had cladosporium present. 
And also before it was typically considered a post-harvest disease, but another study that was performed in 2019 actually found that cladosporium can grow potentially pre-harvest and was found on ripening fruit. And because of all these factors and growers are still having problems with cladosporium, uh, this PhD has been developed because we want to kind of identify what factors can impact cladosporium development. And therefore, hopefully we can create a management practice that can work for growers to help reduce this disease. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just focusing on two experiments that I've performed. These were done throughout 2019 and 2020. And I have some results to show that I think are really relevant to the growers at least. So one of the first things we wanted to find out was, well, what species of cladosporium are actually present on UK and Spanish fruit? Cladosporium is just a genus of fungi and it's a really large genus. It has over 700 species. And these species might actually behave differently to different environmental factors and the way we try and control them. And because of this, we really want to actually identify, well, what's the most common species on UK fruit? And from there, we could tailor all our subsequent experiments to the species that are most applicable to UK fruit. We also included some Spanish isolates because obviously outside of the growing season, we're actually sourcing a lot of our fruit from Spain. And we just want to see if we're getting a similar kind of species representation there as well. Um, to really summarise what I did in very short terms and very abbreviated, we essentially got fruit sent to us from all across the UK. So really big thanks to all the growers that were able to send us fruit. From there, we were able to rot it down and essentially from there, create something that is a pure cladosporium isolate. From that, we were able to extract the DNA and from there, sequence it and use the DNA in a, something. we ran the DNA through something called the BLAST database to any growers, it's essentially a really big database of DNA that if you put a sequence of DNA through, it gives you an approximate species ID. So currently this is what we've used to give us our first rendition of species ID in this experiment. And um, what did we find? Well, we were able to sequence 57 isolates, which was great, it's a really big number. And actually you can see on the graph, the vast majority are cladosporioides. This is really important as a lot of studies that look at air spores um, from fungi find that actually cladosporioides is a really common air spore. This kind of indicates that the primary source of inoculum is really likely coming from the air. So things like venting are probably going to really impact the amount of inoculum in your polytunnels. But this is something we hope to look into into the future. And on the graph, you can also see there's some other less frequent species found, so spermum the monoform and ramatellum, but actually we had a surprisingly large number come out as ambiguous species. It basically means when you run it through the database, you get a jumbled list back of different species. Um, because of this, we're hoping to do something called a phylogenetic analysis, analysis and hopefully from there we can actually res resolve those ambiguous species. But essentially for the purpose of our PhD and the rest of this work, it's we're going to be using cladosporioides in all our inoculation experiments as it's the most prevalently found species on UK fruit. The second experiment I just want to go through briefly is when a raspberry is actually susceptible to cladosporium. Well, like I said previously, another study showed that it can grow on fruit when they're just underripe, but we weren't sure if cladosporium can cause skin lesions from the green stage onwards either. So in this experiment, we were focusing on when are actually fruit susceptible and therefore when should we be applying control measures and again to really summarize the experiment in really brief terms we inoculated four different stages with a cladosporum inoculum or control half were sterilized and half were left unsterilized to essentially show the difference in pre and post harvest growth and from there we scored the fruit for skin lesion severity and stigmata infection severity um, in case anyone doesn't know what the stigmata are, they're just the little hairs you get on raspberries that are quite brown. This is because after the flower has been pollinated, the, those parts of the flower decay and you're left with the little hairs of your fruit. And what did we find? Well, we essentially showed that green fruit are not susceptible to skin lesions. At no point did we ever see skin lesions on green fruit. But we did find skin lesions occurring from ripening fruit onwards and ripe appear more susceptible than ripening fruit. In regards to the stigmata infections, we essentially were interested if cladosporium could colonize the stigmata from an earlier stage of development. 
and then potentially when fruit are more ripe can jump onto the skin to cause skin lesions. And we showed that yes, it can colonize fruit from an earlier stage, so from green, and typically cladosporium is colonized in the stigmata more post-harvest. So on the graph, you can see the different stages, the median infection scores, and typically on the blue, post-harvest growth is more prevalent, which is what we would expect of cladosporium. It's quite a weak pathogen. So in the image of the um, surface of a grape, this is a scanning electron microscopy image. You can see a lot of the hyphae are on the outside of the fruit and they're not penetrating in. So we assume that cladosporium is kind of growing on the outside of the stigmata. And then once it can jump onto the skin, it can cause these horrible skin lesions that are clearly affecting fruit. Um, that's basically the gist of what, to, of what I want to share today, but I just want to summarise the take home messages to take away from this if you are a grower or an agronomist. Um, if you're looking for cladosporium skin lesions, you need to be looking from the ripening stage onwards, and these are likely the stages we need to be applying control measures. We know that now that cladosporioides appears to be the most prevalent species on UK fruit, so it's likely that things like venting may impact the inoculum load in the air, but these are things that we need to determine with future experiments. A previous study focused on how cladosporium interacts with spotted wing drosophila like we heard this morning, and the damage that SWD can cause on fruit actually create, they know that now that it creates these horrible little lesions that fungal pathogens can grow from. So if you have a holistic approach to how you manage disease, if you're controlling for SWD, it lessens the amount of entry points for fungal pathogens to also grow. And finally, we know from cladosporium, it's a saprophyte. It likes to grow on decaying material. So if you have dead leaves, dead canes in your polytunnels, you're basically creating an inoculum source. So you really kind of need to be removing the dead material as much as possible. Um, thanks everyone for listening and thanks to all the people on screen and many more I couldn't list. We had a lot of help from growers with this project so far and I'm sure they'll continue to help along the way. And if anyone has questions they want to ask me, you can always send me an email as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, yeah, well, one question from me, I suppose, Give, given this, the scenario that I painted earlier, um, that particular grower, one of the reasons I think he had cladosporium was because of water relations in the plant, because the, 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 the conditions were too humid and we were getting the sticky exudate build up um, around the, the sepals of the, of the flower. Um, are you suggesting that if there's more cladosporum that's airborne, we could uh, be vent improve our venting, but by the same time increasing the problem if there's lots of cladosporum flying around, which in which case there could be a bit of a double-edged sword here? Exactly. So this is why we need to actually investigate if the inoculum outside behaves in the same way as the inside, because it may be if you have a fully enclosed polytunnel, it's not the best idea because obviously the humidity is going to increase but also you might be increasing the number of spores if there's not ventilation taking the spores out, but we can't definitively say anything yet until we do some air spore studies. Okay, that's helpful. One more question before we move on. Um, Lauren, are you going to look to see if there is any variance within varieties for cladosporium susceptibility? Is that something you will have time to look at? Yeah, so actually this is something we've performed this year. So we've been screening different varieties just to see if there, there is a difference in the susceptibility to cladosporium. So hopefully growers will be able to take away that some varieties might be more resistant, but also it might be something breeders need to take into account when they're screening for disease. But for now, we I can't say anything on those results because we haven't analysed them yet, but hopefully I'll have something to show next time. OK, now we shall look forward to that. There's a lot more work to be done. Uh, so thank you, Lauren, for sharing the, your uh, latest experiences. Uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you again. Um, takes us on to our next speaker, uh, who is Matt Pat Rupar. Uh, Matt is, again, known to many of you, I think. Uh, he has been working at NIAB EMR uh, as a pathologist within the, the uh, crop protection team at NIAB EMR for some time. And Matt is not a CTP student. Uh, we, we have one more CTP student to come, but Matt has, uh, has, has moved on from there. Matt, good afternoon. And you're going to tell us a little bit about um, the use of seaweed biostimulants and precision irrigation to reduce water and fertilizer use. Yeah, let, let me just check if you can hear me well. I can see you and hear your presentation very well. Thank Excellent. you, Matt. Fantastic. So yeah, we're going to go right into it. 
Um, right. We were running for the last couple of years. Uh, we were um, a part of the Buyer for Safe project in which we had a, a very simple but um, simply defined but very difficult to achieve aim to reduce water and fertilizer use in horticulture and our part of the horticulture were strawberry and raspberry production. So we were testing whether um, we were testing June bearer strawberries and primark and raspberries and we tested sort of inter play of two different systems. First was using a commercial um, precision drip irrigation when you add only the amount of water fertigation that's being used in certain conditions, monitored in real time. And second, um, to use seaweed biostimulants um, applied, it would co complete the commercial seaweed biostimulants apart from one that we developed within the consortium. And we apply them according to um, uh, manufacturer's requirements the same way as would be applied in the commercial um, uh, setup. The um, reason why we went for seaweed biostimulants is that seaweeds are known to have biostimulant compounds in them. And the good thing about the seaweed biostimulants is that you can grow them in polluted um, rivers and oceans and, and seas where they can take the nutrients that we've, um, that we've um, put into our waterways through uh, using for ex excessive fertilizer, they can pull it out and then you can make a product out of that, which is a biostimulant that in theory could then reduce water and uh, uh, fertilizer um, use back in the horticulture or land. So we've chosen um, five different seaweed biostimulants. In uh, two years, we actually tested um, our vascular mycorrhiza product, root grow as well. And we've developed, actually, we have a partner, North Sea Farmers from um, Netherlands, who actually are running the first commercial scale pilot seaweed farm where the seaweed was harvested. And we've developed our own bio for safe biostimulant, biostimulant that we tested as well. And just to um, sort of try the two um, systems together, we did test biostimulants in optimal irrigation conditions and then you reduce the irrigation conditions as well. And we had different amount of reduced irrigation. So we had loads of different methods that we assessed performance of um, our irrigation strategy and performance of our plants with and without biostimulants, had the randomized block design in sort of um, imitating commercial practice. And we were measuring everything from coir moisture to yield and class and bricks chlorophyll fluorescence and photosystem efficiency. We measured stem water potential. And then we had the privilege to, to, to test the new type of sensors that are measuring leaf thickness, or in, in, which is a proxy for how much water is in the leaf, and real-time flow um, of sap through raspberry stem through the sensors that you can see in the picture here that were developed by University of Ghent in Belgium. And we measured all sorts of fresh and dry weight. And on top of all that, we had the um, water use efficiency and nitrogen usual use efficiency analysis done through isotope. So we had a whole lot of uh, methods in to try to see the, um, the different amount of uh, irrigation and um, biostimulant effect. So in 2018, we, have, we run every, all the biostimulants at optimal irrigation and fertigation only as a baseline. And we saw no significant positive or negative effect of the biostimulants of the yield or any other parameters that I've just listed. Um, so then in 2019, we decided we're gonna, we're gonna run them both all five biostimulants in two different irrigation regimes. One is 60% coil moisture um, for raspberries and uh, for, sorry, for strawberries and 65 for raspberries, which is about optimal irrigation. Then we reduce that quite severely to, to get stress in. And interestingly enough, just um, reducing um, uh, the coil moisture to about 40% reduced input into strawberry production. So input in, of your water and fertilizer by about 50% and had no effect on yield uh, or quality. However, when we did uh, the same reduction in coir moisture in, in raspberry, we reduced to 70% input, which is a bit harsh, and we had significant yield reduction. 
but biostimulants um, did not improve yields or quality either in full or reduced, but they didn't decrease the yields or quality either. So no positive or negative effect of biostimulants in these, these two irrigation regimes. So we were not quite happy with it. So in 2020, we did the both optimal and reduced irrigation, and now we added a short-term stress to each of them. So we got back from the biostimulant producers saying, maybe you stress them too much, biostimulants can't do everything. So this time we just in introduced short-term stress, which was every Monday for three weeks, we switched off irrigation for 24 hours. And on Tuesday, the same day, we put it back on to give them the short-term stress. And this time we could only test two different biostimulants. So we used Calpac and our own biostimulant. And unfortunately, again, we saw no significant positive or negative effect of at least of Calpac. We did see quite positive results, especially in yield in full and in reduced irrigation um, for our own biostimulant that we produced. But that was small scale trial. When we repeated it this year in larger scale, we did not see the same positive effect on yield and quality again. So it could be that is due to year to year differences um, or something to do with the, the, in the small scale trial was, a, um, was sort of um, a fluke. So we found no real significant effect of those five tested seaweed biostimulants, but obviously there are thousands of biostimulants out there. So to get to the bottom, if there's any commercially available biostimulants that, that we have evidence for their effect, we've put together a freely available biostimulant database. And to do that, we have reviewed more than 250 independent scientific publications which had good experimental design, used biostimulants that are actually products on the market, and we're reporting all the effects, positive, negative, and no effects. We're kind of focusing a little bit of crops grown in the UK and EU, and we've um, summarized the papers in sort of clear way um, so the growers can actually use that information to decide whether or not they want to use the, the product in their circumstances. And at the moment, we have more than 700 entries in the database, and it's still growing. And the entry looks something like that. So here are two entries for strawberries. You can see that you can um, see what the effect was. For example, increased cold stress tolerance, and then you can read exactly how the effect was measured and what the, what the percentage was. You can read how it was, the trial was done. And then most importantly, how the product was delivered in the trial. So when, at which concentration was it spray, injection, whichever. So you can actually get a grip on the actual application of the biostimulant in your own systems. What else do we have on this webpage? So this is bioforsafe.eu. We have, apart from biostimulant database that you can search and, and filter, we have all the information on the different sensors of how, how you could potentially use them in your practice to better optimize fertilizer and water use. We have the we have the details of trial protocols that you could use to reduce, so sort of benchmarks, how to reduce water and fertilizer and how we did it. And then you can learn more about biostimulants and about our, our project as well. So with, with this, I'll quickly just conclude that even though um, no positive or negative effects were found of these commercial seaweed biostimulants that we tested, we can only test um, five different biostimulants, that there, there are a lot of different out there that you might need to, to try, but choosing the right biostimulant for the right crop and timing and dose are all very important. So we can um, look at this on, on, our, on our database. What I would say is that um, the way we use precision irrigation to, to do a sort of a hard, um, very, very stress to, to induce very stressful conditions maybe wasn't the best, but even in that, in one year, we, we, we reduced by 50%. So um, without reduced inputs by about 50% in strawberry without redu reducing the yields. So we kind of conclude that if you, you can probably reduce by at least 20% versus the current standard and which will reduce your runoffs by more than 50% without ever compromising yield and quality just by putting precision irrigation in. So irrigate when required and not before or after. 
So I'd like to just quickly acknowledge the funders, the Interreg project, the bio for safe all our uh, partners from four countries, from Belgium, Netherlands, and France, and in the UK, and my, our NIA BMR pathology and crop science and production team have been instrumental to actually deliver this work across the last three years. So thank you. And thank you, Mike. Questions? Thank you. That's uh, that's very interesting. I should just add that uh, I remember a few years ago, AHDB funded a project looking at the use of a whole range of different products, biostimulants, pick-me-ups and all sorts of things um, to improve the establishment of ever better strawberries. This was in so a soil grown crop. Uh, and surprise, surprise, we drew no firm conclusions. Uh, <laughs> so it, yeah. it does seem to be a repetition of this. Um, I suppose probably you'd need to do these sorts of projects over a period of years to, to, to really learn anything. Is that fair to say? Maybe, uh, uh, you know, yeah. a short-term project is not going to teach us a lot. That I think there are two things that really play. First is, I think even more important, is that the system that we looked at, strawberry raspberry production in coir in polytunnels, is so well optimized that it's actually the conditions are more important than all the biostimulants. So if you have a hot year that uh, plants are struggling, then biostimulants may help a little bit. But when you have on your average year, you're, you, you're driving it at 100% pretty much. So biostimulants can't do anything, which is not to say the biostimulants are probably not useful in soil or in outdoor grown, where you have much more of environmental perturbations, year to year difference, soil fertility is, um, is different there as well, which you can improve with biostimulants. Um, but yes, definitely long term projects and may, maybe projects where you actually testing biostimulants on a large scale and you measure commercial, commercially um, more graspable. So if you, if you measure profits directly, so spray trials when biostimulants are a part of the whole, um, the whole process, not just as, 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 as we did, where we just treated diseases, but, uh, but biostimulants were the only treatment that we were doing. Um, because maybe 3% um, um, effect on, 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 on yield is, is actually significant increase of profit for a grower on a 10 hectare farm, but we can't see it on maybe 2000 plants that, we, that we're growing in our trials. Yeah, okay. I think the, 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 web, uh, the website that you've uh, highlighted there is a very useful resource because I'm sure there will be people out there who would quite like to consider uh, assessing more biostimulants. So thank you for drawing our attention to that. There aren't any more you questions. Must... I will move on to Shang Ming. Uh, we've got three speakers left for this afternoon and we've got three of the heavyweights from Naya BMR. First up, Shang Ming Zhu, um, who is uh, well known to most of you, um, who's the head of pathology uh, and science at Naya BMR. He's been doing some work on recycling coir, which I know is, is of big practical implications for implication for lots of growers. So Zhang Ming, please share with us what you've been finding. Okay, trying to share a screen. Um, That's it. We can hear you, see you, and see your screen. Thank, uh, thank you, Zhang Ming. Okay, I'm trying to do a PowerPoint show. Still. Can you see the PowerPoint show? Can you see the screen? Yep, the screen? That's, work, that's working perfectly, Zhang okay, Ming. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Today, we'll just give us spend 10 minutes to talk about a small component of big uh, interact project on circular economy. So we talk about the direct use of spent coir in table pop, top strawberry production. So this background slide, we are don't need to say anything because everyone knows the coir is the media used for software production in the UK. Uh, usually, you need for one season only and occasionally for two seasons, but they're not reused primarily because perceived yield decline and also possibly disease accumulation in the coir. So at the start of this project, about four, four or five years ago, the concerns are really about perceived yield declines. What are we trying to do is we really see whether that, that perceived yield decline is true if it is, and to what extent is it your decline? Second part is really say, uh, can we use the, some type of biochar to amend the use coir, see where that will uh, reduce the risk of your decline or even increase the fruit quality? That's very straightforward. Two questions we are asking for. 
So expand design is pretty, again, straightforward. So in year one, we only have a one year old uh, span coil and also have fresh coil. So we both, uh, then we actually have two bar char, which is from oak and from mixed wood. These char uh, bar char supply from a Dutch research organization. So uh, we amended or not amended the virgin of one year old span coil. Then in 2019, we have another a fresh uh, coir and uh, amend it or not amend again, then the, the previous 2018 coir we retain for further use. So you have a create second, second year old, two year old coir and 2020 the same thing, have 30 year old coir. And in 2021, uh, although I didn't present the data today, but we're still collating or trying to compile the data moment, we actually retain 2020 experiment again for one more season with same plants. So essentially second season crop. Okay, so the, this is a reasonable size of uh, experiment. We'll have a one tunnel and uh, have four blocks and each block, uh, each treatment has four coil bags. It uh, depends on the year, we use eight to 10 plants per, per bag. And in 2018, 2019, we use a June barrier. But in 2020, after discussion with the growers, we decided to use ever barriers. The reason they told us is because your decline maybe is more apparent in ever barriers. Okay. So we assess the yield, bricks, and plant mortality in every trial. Straight to the the result 2018 is a graph clearly show you that no difference whatsoever between all the treatment, whether whether it's oak amend, uh, whether it's the bar chart amended, virgin, or, or one year old uh, span coil. So there's no difference whatsoever. And similarly, there's no difference between bricks either. Okay, that's a straightforward 2018. 2019, again, same, same pattern again. And the new difference, or oh, the, the new statistically significant difference between treatment, between bar char or long bar char men coir, or between the three age groups, virgin one year old or two year old coir. Okay, that's again, that's, remember 2018, 2019 are a burst, we both use the um, June barrier. Interesting, in 2000, again, the new, new difference in the bricks as well. In 2020, the interesting, and um, we use the ever barriers. So you can see clearly see the trend of dec decline yield with the increasing age of the coil. And the annual decline is about six to seven percent, but still it's not justify the, the, the investment in new coil if, if declines only six or seven percent. But the only uh, a caution I want to show at here is because remember 2020 is COVID year. Our planting is delayed by three months. Instead of uh, planting in late, uh, early April or late, uh, mid April, we plant in late June or early July. So the actual yield is very low because we had a few harvests, okay? That's, a, that's, that's another reason why we retain the year the, the, the planting for 2021. We still analyze the base moment. But from purely from 2020, it, it does appear that some sort of year decline, but it's very low. The level of year decline is not warranted uh, new investment or, or buy new coil bags. Okay? I, I did the, some economic assessment on that one. And as I said, this is a very small piece of the whole small component of the of the entire project. We have other red activity in the project, which ran to the strawberry production. One is EDAS is developing six alternative substrate with partially funding from uh, from AHDB. And we evaluate that pro the six alternative substrate for um, strawberry production. We also made uh, bar char from spent coir used uh, from strawberry and also use the bar char in strawberry to see whether that have any benefit the results still being analyzed and that's been done in the uk and also in belgium one thing is very interesting the bar char made from spent coir strawberry has a much higher concentration of nitrogen we also look at the the mark uh, colonization different substrate particularly the substrate made from EDAS, uh, made off by EDAS. 
We also assess the possibility of, of toxicity in Spain coir as well. So that's the summarize what we have done. So now what's the future? So having talked to growers again, they, they raise another issue uh, concerning the reuse of the coirs because fatofra. So what do we want to do now is to assess the risk of fatofra inoculum build up in Spain coir over time. Is if that building up is really significant, then we need to search for alternative treatment to treat the uh, coir or treat the plants in season or off season of the coir to reduce the inocular level. Or alternatively, do you have any use other physical ways to clean up the spent coir? So that's the thing we are trying to develop. At the moment we are discussing with a couple of growers to actually do a larger scale demonstration using coir is feasible and large commercial scale with a very negligible EO penalty as long as the photographer is well controlled. So we are actually actively searching for funding, talk to growers trying to hold, do this work, continue this work over the next few years. So it's remained me to say and thank the funding body, uh, the Interact Funding plus Berry Garden support and uh, the whole entire NIRE EMR team conducted experiment, particularly 2020, 21, because the curve is so difficult, and, but we managed to uh, complete the experiment. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shang Ming. Uh, just very much time for one quest, quick question. Um, have you assessed the changes in physical characteristics and coir as the time goes by? Is that something you've been able to do? Uh, yes or no. Yes means we actually collected the uh, coir. Uh, we the extract the microbial DNA. We sent to the sequence, see if any build up of um, intended or not beneficial organism in the coir, that's one thing we did. And also, uh, we all, also I say, we also assess the, um, the toxicity of the spent coir. As far as other physical characteristics that we didn't do, um, but we are talking to a uh, coir making company at the moment. They will actually, uh, they're happy to engage in our work to assess the spent coir characteristics in the few years, in the next few years, if we get funding for. Okay, thank you. Um, one very final question, then we must move on. Um, Shang Ming, have you assessed the effects of reusing coir on crop quality as well as the as well as the decline in total yield? Uh, we dissect, we assess the brick and also class one. Uh, both there's no there's no significant difference. No, no differences. Yeah. Okay. Shang Ming, thank you for sharing that with us. Much appreciated. Um, thank you to Shang Ming. Um, so we move on to strawberry breeding. And obviously, we've heard a little bit about um, from Samantha and from Matteo about uh, molecular markers and so on, finding resistance for cactodum and for uh, and for powdery mildew. Adam is now with us. Uh, Adam is with us and he is going to update us on the latest um, advances at NIAB EMR Strawberry Breeding Club. Adam. Hi uh, Scott, uh, hopefully you can see my screen okay. Yep, all perfect, thanks Adam. Brilliant. Yeah, and uh, I think Scott, I commented, I think I'm more middleweight than heavyweight, but thanks for the um, compliment anyway. But the, um, okay, uh, good to see everyone. It's really good attendance today and um, I just wanted to give you a very brief update on the East Morning Strawberry Breeding Club and what we've got coming through from the um, from the program. Right, just uh, trying to get the get it to move on. Okay, so um, for those of you who aren't aware what the, uh, about the club. Uh, we're funded by a number of members. Uh, in fact, we've got 10 members now. Um, we've had a bit of a change this year in that we've had Berry Gardens take on some additional shares within the club. And you can see that we still have the HDB involved, which gives us the public element of our works. It makes all the varieties available to every sector of the industry. Um, uh, many of you remember that we traditionally used to work in the soil. Uh, we moved over onto substrate for all our trialing uh, two years ago and to make us very relevant to the UK um, production system. Uh, and actually from this year, we're now starting to assess our seedling populations and substrate. So we are um, transforming or making that move across to, to substrate. Uh, and another big change as well, 
and it's something that happened last year but has continued this year is that we have taken in in-house all the licensing and marketing of our varieties through uh, mauling fruits and i'll leave some details on my end slide about mauling fruits so you can check out their website and uh, we've also just had uh, two new people um, uh, directly involved with the program um, join us this year we've got professor dan Sargent back as the head of uh, breeding and genetics within the department so we're very glad to see dan back and have his import into some of the more fundamental science as well as the commercial side and also um, Alan uh, Borliano, who's working on varieties development. So he's making sure that anything that comes out of the program uh, actually uh, it goes out onto trial and he's uh, looking at the development of that with growers. So taking that, that, that step into sort of grower world. And as well as working with our funders, we've also um, stepped up to the place in terms of uh, working with lots of other companies in terms of agronomic work. So again, we're um, enhancing the work that we're doing for blueprinting our varieties. So when it gets to growers, we have some more information about how best to grow the variety. And those are just a, a list of some of the people that we, we are working with at the moment. So moving on to the two new releases, these are two new varieties that we're proud to have released this year. They were both released at Fruit Focus. We have Morning Gaze and Vitality, and I'll give you just a quick overview on, on both of them. So Morning Vitality, it's uh, an early mid-season June bearer with um, very good uh, class one yield. It has, we've got moderate disease resistance there, but it does have good disease resistance against the three most common diseases. So verticillium, um, crown rot, and also powdery mildew. It's got excellent fruit display. And as you can see from the photo, it's sort of a, a lovely sort of waxy skin with attractive firm fruit. Um, so where do we see morning vitality fitting into the industry, into production? Well, it's actually just slightly earlier than centenary, just a, a, um, a, maybe a day or so when we look at tunnel production. Um, but it has got uh, very useful uh, yield attributes. And if you look at the percentage class one in that table at the bottom, you can see there's hardly any mark out at all. And in fact, berry weight can be very good on it as well. So that's um, uh, certainly um, comparable uh, in that trial to centenary. It's got the potential for um, good bricks levels and um, shelf life has been good with good firm fruit. And in fact, when we look at it in glasshouse production, so away from tunnel tabletops, um, we seem to see some uh, accentuation of the earliness. And um, this was some work that was carried out by PCH in um, Belgium, so this is independent trialing, uh, where in fact it was uh, coming in at the same time as Clary, which is probably a good five days ahead of Centenary, maybe a little bit earlier. And um, in fact, in terms of overall fruit quality, outclass Clary, uh, as well as outclassing it in terms of uh, shelf life, and that was the case for most of the varieties that are in that trial. So it certainly has a um, potential. Now, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, we're building up on that work now and we're trying to understand how best to grow it. Um, so we've commissioned a num number of trials that will be ongoing into 2022 and 23. We're looking at different tipping dates um, in propagation, um, different feed regimes in propagation. And then working with um, Mark at East Smalling, Mark House and his team, looking at a whole raft of attributes that we consider will make it uh, easier to understand the variety in terms of its requirements. And also with um, some contribution from the HDB, we were able to produce some plant material last year where we're looking at um, double cropping within Glasshouse where we've got some indications it does seem to work well in that, that system and looking at sort of plant densities to get um, uh, good production. So moving on to ACE, uh, this is an ever bearer. Um, this, you may have heard of it as EMR 796. It's now released as, as ACE. At all intents and purposes, uh, I see it's like a morning an ever-bearing morning centenary. It's got uh, very good fruit quality, great size and really sweet, juicy um, fruit uh, and uh, excellent fruit size and yield potential. So this is just some data. Again, this has come from um, uh, independent sites. This isn't from East Morling. Um, so, uh, the top left one, you can see the um, crop profile against Murano. It actually comes in with a slightly um, heavier um, crop early on. 
uh, has a little bit of a dip and then picks back up. This year on many sites, we, uh, a lot of people actually commented about how uh, the, we got the continuous stages of production. So on any one plant, uh, any, any one point in the season, we were seeing good flower production, green fruit and ripe fruit. So it really does seem to have the ability to, to want to kick out fruit. And that's reflected when you look at the bar chart on the right, um, which uh, is from Delphi, um, some work they did. And you can see there, it's quite a phenomenal yield. Um, this is just on mini tray plants that were um, uh, put in six plants per meter. Uh, and you can see that we've got over, over 10 kilos per linear meter uh, from that density of class one fruit, which is, is quite extraordinary. And then coming back to the UK and just some tabletop tunnel tabletop sites again you can see where we're doing some work with different plant types and some different densities but if you look at the total yield column uh, you can see the, the potential there on, on one site uh, 1.7 kilos per plant um, and hardly any mark out at all there but again look at the mean berry weight for an ever bearer this is fantastic it's really coming out as a useful almost a june bearer typing uh, ever bearer now we are aware that ACE has had some problems with powdery mildew. Uh, we had it on a limited number of sites with a limited number of plants in 2020, and we did see uh, probably uh, just under a third of plants were showing um, uh, sort of serious to medium levels of mildew. Uh, this year, we've extended the number of sites that we've been trying to get on. We have seen mildew again, as, as you'd expect, it's been a higher uh, disease pressure for mildew. But it's interesting that the severity of the disease has been less and um, we aware from talking to growers uh, they know that there is some um, uh, problem with mildew sometimes on ace and so they are have been adapting and developing just to um uh, to compensate for that and that's actually been shown within a year that there can be um quite a difference made but there's more more to be done and so for uh, next year, we're doing a number of mildew management trials, um, looking at chemicals, uh, chemicals plus um, uh, bioactives, and some UVC and UVC plus chemical uh, trials uh, to see how that affects the mildew. We're also looking at propagation and production of different plant types, and again, the work with Mark to understand sort of the irrigation, uh, some of the irrigation regimes that will help it to uh, sort of prosper, hopefully. So that's what we've got out there. Those are the recent releases, both released this year. Um, very quickly, I just want to show you what's coming through the pipeline. You know, we don't sit on our laurels at East Morning, and there's plenty more coming through. And just to demonstrate, we've got 13 advanced lines that are going through into growers' trials um, over, over the next three years. You can see that they're spread over the season. So we've got the target uh, cultivars at the top, and you can see what we're, which uh, sectors of the season we're, we're going for. And if I can quickly just go through some of the more promising selections, just ones to look out for. In 2022, we've got this 2622. It's a true late variety. It's probably later than a lure. Uh, it's about 14 days later than uh, centenary. Um, but it's classified by having a uh, very high yield, um, but also very sweet fruit. Uh, average bricks has been about 9.5. Um, and uh, retailers, that it's been sampled to, uh, sort of really, uh, it's really been on their radar, they've really clambered for it. Uh, next to it is 2836, which uh, we're going to see in trial uh, again next year. Um, I mean, if you just look at the fruit, uh, it's, it's just fantastic. Uh, it stood out in our trials. Um, it, it's absolutely perfect. 85% of it is greater than 35 mil, so it's got this fantastic fruit size. You can see how well it's displayed. This is something we've been breeding for, these long pedicels or stalks. So it's very easy to pick. And it's outclassing centenary in terms of yields. So that's one to watch. And then 2910, which actually is just from this year. So it's really a new kid on the block. It's just um, it's straight from trial. And to all intents and purposes, this is like centenary. Uh, it's got similar yield. It's got similar fruit size. Uh, it's got similar uh, appearance and flavour. Um, and if you look at that graph there on the season, you can see that it comes in even at the same time as centenary. The difference we're seeing here, though, is that we uh, are some of the predictive um, scoring that we've done with Crayon Rock from some of the work that we've done with the fundamental science is indicating that this should have good resistance to Crayon Rock. 
So it'll be interesting to see how that stands up to in grower trials. And then moving on to Everbearers, a uh, slightly uh, smaller pipeline, um, and that's because of the, uh, the bias in, the, in terms of the number of seedlings that we produce. So we do look at less Everbearers than June bearers. But we've got eight here that are showing promise that are going into large scale or even commercial size um, uh, trials over the next two years. And again, just quickly to go through these, uh, we've got EMR 704, um, which is going to be in trial uh, this year. Uh, slightly more seedy appearance than we normally go for, but it's got an absolutely stonking yield. Um, it's really nice early cropping variety, uh, very well liked in Scotland, where we've had it on sites up there. Um, large fruit size and a very robust variety, again, with good uh, sort of full flavour. So it's one that we um, are quite interested in uh, because of that fruit size and yield. 794, uh, very similar to Ace, um, comes in slightly earlier, slightly smaller um, fruit size, but it's got that really attractive June bearer look about it as well. And um, we think that it's probably got slightly less issues with um, mildew, but we're going to trial it head to head with ACE this year and see how it stands up. And then EMR863, which we're looking at in large scale trials in 2023. Um, again, another robust variety, good yielding and really good full flavor. So uh, we really are starting to get quite saturated with good ever bearers now. And finally, two of the uh, sort of younger varieties, we've got um, uh, EMR925, Again, which if you look, it's very large fruit size, um, very attractive. And you can see the display, you can see what we're trying to do in terms of that picking efficiency. Um, slightly later season, some varieties, although we've been picking all the way into November this year, so that may be advantageous. And then finally, EMR965, which is just a uh, cracking yield, um, really good fruit size. And we've only seen that this year, so we will be interested to see how it performs in 2023. So conscious of time, I will um, probably leave it there. If you're interested in any of the varieties, Vitality or Ace, please visit maulingfruits.com. Uh, we've got a new website up there that's uh, full of technical information and also where you can buy plants, the so license holders. And finally, just to say thank you to my colleagues within the strawberry breeding team and also the irrigation teams that work with us now on substrate, uh, all the support staff, farm and glass that we have at East Smalling. And uh, finally to the funders, they're all listed there at the bottom and, and the trials officer that the club uh, um, helped uh, to carry out our trials, that's Rob Cook from Berry Plants. So thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Uh, that's wonderful. And thank you for sticking to time as well. That's really helpful. I think um, that final uh, mention of Morning Fruits website, I think that's really, really helpful because, you know, there are times when we all want to have a look at varieties that are coming out and can't remember the latest missive that you've sent round or the latest fact sheet or whatever. So that's really, really helpful. I'm sure people will like to use that site. Um, I, I, I make one other plea. I've, I've asked Adam to do it so many times. Um, we've come such a long way since El Santa, and I still think you should have El Santa there as a comparison to all these other fantastic varieties you've got. Or maybe you well, need to find Cambridge favourite or something even older. <laughs> well, well I, I think we, d we did do it for our 100th anniversary where we put Cambridge favourite and Emerald Sovereign in, in there alongside Morning Centenary and... Uh, I don't think we had much fruit to sample, to be honest. Compared yeah. to the greenery, so it was, uh... Anyway, you've, you've done an amazing job. So thank you and, and thanks for your presentation this afternoon, which takes us to our final speaker of the afternoon, uh, and that is Mark Else, uh, who will be telling us all about the Wet Centre. Um, Mark has presented on the Wet Centre in previous webinars in the last um, 12 to 18 months. And uh, this year, um, he, uh, 2021, they've been doing more trials at the Wet Centre, and he's going to share some of the results of the key findings that they've made from 2021 with us. So hopefully, Mark, um, you're just beginning to uh, come through our system. Just mm. trying to move the presentation there. Now we're in business. Yeah. Uh, okay. We, we, we're not on your first, ah, there we are. We've got your homepage now. The floor is yours, Mark. Tell us what you found this year. 
Thank you, Scott. And um, thanks everybody for hanging on in there to the end of the day. Uh, it's a great privilege as always to uh, present work from the Wet Centre. Uh, hopefully you're all familiar now with the work we do in the Wet Centre. Uh, but I'd just again like to start off as I often do by thanking our, our partners in the Wet Centre for their continued uh, support in, in the work that, that we're doing. And, and you can see uh, the, the full members and the associate members uh, listed there. So um, I'll just really highlight some of the work we've done uh, this year. We've, we've been doing a lot of work on various biostimulants, uh, which is obviously relevant to, uh, to Matt's presentation earlier. Um, I'll present those results probably in, in the new year once we've had a chance to discuss them with our, our, our partners. Um, so I just thought I'd give you an overview of some of the work we've done this year and how this season compared to, to last season, for example. So again, uh, using marlene uh, champion at, at the wet center uh, planted at the end of March this year. We'll all know that it was a very different April and May this year compared to last year. You remember the, <clears throat> the sunny uh, blue skies at the beginning of lockdown last year and contrast that to the conditions we all uh, felt this year here in the UK. And so, and that was really sort of born, um, born out by the, the the thermal time was only 52% uh, in, uh, in the end of May compared to last year. So very different, very cool, very cloudy and a very different season. And of course that inevitably impacts on plant establishment, which then can impact on class one yields as I'll explain in a moment. Um, so as many of you know, we're using a uh, rainwater uh, capture and, and reuse system here at the wet center. And so we installed a, um, a digital uh, water treatment system based on hydrogen peroxide uh, to make sure we were removing or um, uh, negating any biological contaminants in the in the water. First harvest this year was on the 15th of June, so almost a couple of weeks later than last year. And you'll see there then that the class one yields this year were about 22% down compared to uh, the yields we obtained from the same variety, planted at the same site, uh, planted at the same time, planted in the same coir, given the same fertigation regime. So very different conditions this year and last year. And so just really before we go into perhaps explore some likely explanations for that, uh, we've just got a couple of polls just to sort of uh, get your input into various parts of the presentation. Um, so, so Scott, I think I'll, I'll leave that now to you and to Lauren. Okay, okay, thank, thank you, you, Mark. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so if, if you, you want, want to uh, look at Mark's call uh, and uh, respond accordingly now. Everybody appears to be voting for you, Mark. Well, not for you, but... Uh, <laughs> Okay, okay, I think, I think things, things are levelling out. out. Oh, still some coming in. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I think we've probably got to a conclusion there, Mark. Can you can you, are you seeing those figures? I can yes, yes. So yeah. it's very encouraging that that most most of the audience obviously recognise the importance of of light when it comes to the berry yields and and quality. And I'll go on to explain a little bit why um, we think that might be. Thank you. Okay, so if I go on to my next slide, there we go. Thank you. My slides now seem to be uh, stuck, so excuse me, bear with me a moment. Okay, there we go. Oops, gone too far as ever. So we just need to go back up to the um, other slide. There seems to be a bit of a delay, sorry about that. Well, while we're waiting for the slide to go back up, I'll, I'll just uh, talk about this slide, which is we often see or we always see a difference in class one yield between the uh, what we call the commercial area at the wet centre and in the auto vented area, which, as you can see in the picture on the pictures on the right there, the, the commercial area is a is a standard commercial uh, 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 polytunnel and the advanced area, then we have the roof vents in there. 
And over the last sort of four or five years, we always see a reduction in, in yield in the advanced area compared to um, the commercial area. And so, you know, just to be clear, that's the same film in same age of film, same type of film, same characteristics, um, same planting day, everything's very similar. The only difference is, of course, is the, is the polytonal structure. And so, so we think then that there's a, a possibly an effect of the um, of the steel in the roof that's obscuring uh, some of the light. So you can see there uh, in, in the photograph at the bottom right, then that's a, a PAR sensor in, in the bottom right, which is measuring uh, photosynthetically active um, radiation. And you can see then on occasion, then we do see these dips in, in light interception at that particular point, because of course the, <clears throat> the sun's going around the steel work. So, we often see a five or six percent decrease in 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 par in, in those tunnels, and that more often than not translates to a five or six percent decrease in in yield. Um, so um, that's um, that's often the case. Um, I'm just trying to go back up to my other slide. I, I don't think I can. Is it not? Is it not moving, Mark? No, so I don't know whether Lauren can, can perhaps take over. We, we yeah, yeah, possibly. Uh, we, we can, can see if we can get um, your presentation back up. Um, do you want to, I mean, we might wonder if you want to stop. You want to stop presenting, Mark, and, and, and then reload it. We could try that, yeah, let's see. Let's let me try again. There. Can you see that one? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to move it? Well, uh, okay. I need to be on this one, so I'll, I'll just. Yeah, perfect. That's good. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So, so, so this is just the cropping profile over the 2021 season on the on the left hand side there, compared to the cropping profile on in 2020, and, and you'll see there immediately, um, as I mentioned, uh, lower yields in in 2021. And that was noticeable right from the outset. Then we we were only um, only cropping 150 grams from the first flush uh, this year, whereas last year we were cropping 330 grams. So so a significant decrease in yield that of course you then never can catch up on. And so very different uh, trust structure to the one we would expect in Marling uh, Champion. Very simple trust structure in the first first flush there, and that really sort of uh, points to conditions during propagation. And and obviously that. The quality of the plant material is, uh, is absolutely key, as we all know, to optimizing yields and quality. Um, and so, in the coming year, uh, 2022, we'll uh, again use Marlin Champion, but but we'll uh, be able to source plants from uh, within uh, the UK. Okay, so I've already explained that one. Um, so. We also did some work last year on uh, looking at different films and and. Um, not many of you visited last year, but I think I gave a, a soft root presentation at an AHDB event on, on the Lumitech films. And, and just to, just to summarise there, we again saw a 16, 17% decrease in light in PAR um, uh, transmission through the film. And you can see that uh, in, in the graph on the left there, that, that, that diverging, those two diverging lines. Um, and again, we see then, you can see the graph on the, on the right is the cumulative class one yield. And again, we see a significant reduction in class one yield from those plants that are to all intents and purposes under exactly the same environment, of course, apart from, uh, apart from the different films. So there's a very strong, in our work, a very strong correlation between the, uh, the amount of par the plants are intercepting and uh, the class one yield. And so to come on to compare last year and this year, uh, so you'll see there on the left, uh, the blue bars are the yield from the Marlin Champion this year, and the red bars are uh, those from last year. So obviously right from the get-go, very, very different yields, and you can see those, you know, those, those differences sort of increasing uh, before stabilizing over the season. Now in 2021, uh, we inserted or installed a, a second uh, thrust support tape. So we were we were seeing less truss kinking in 2021, so we had uh, less less way through than we did previously. Um, so, so that wasn't the issue there. Um, but if you look at the graph on the on the right hand side, this is a this is satellite derived PAR. So this is data provided by uh, our partners WeatherQuest, and this is satellite derived estimates of PAR um, at the wet center uh, over the last sort of 10 or so years. And the first thing to see then is the, is the black line that sort of plateaus halfway through August. Um, obviously, we have the, 
that complete data set now. But you'll see there that that's a very, um, yeah, that's a typical sort of level of par. The average par is probably, the 10 year average is probably the orange line just above that. So this year we tended to see typical values of, of photosynthetically active radiation reaching the crop. And this is on the outside of the polytunnels. You can also hopefully see then uh, 2020, which is the sort of the lime, green line right at the very top there. So, so right from the end of March, early April, we saw this, this you know, this, this exceptional light intensity reaching those crops. And we think that was very important, of course, in driving the, uh, the high yields we got last year. And this is really borne out if we look at the um, class one yields in the different rows within uh, the wet center tunnels. So if we just concentrate on the table on the left for now, which is the commercial area, you'll see there we have six tunnels per row. And so row one is always on the eastern side of the tunnel and row six is always on the western side of the tunnel. And you can see there in the second column, uh, the class one yields per plant. So up to uh, over 1.3 kilograms in, in row four. And you can see then in the next column, then the, the total hourly par that was accumulated over the season. So this is a light that drives photosynthesis. And there's a very strong correlation, um, albeit it's just a correlation, but very strong correlation between the amount of light intercepted by those plants and the uh, resulting class one yields. So you can see very high yields in, the, in, in row three, four and five. Uh, and of course, lower par again means lower yields. And you can see that in row six uh, there. What we're especially interested in though is row one, where we have a relatively low uh, accumulated par value but we have higher yields than we would expect from that par. So we're getting more fruit per unit of light interception than we would necessarily expect from, from row one. So we're very interested in, in understanding why this might be. And so um, one of the projects that we're hosting at the wet center is an ongoing Innovate UK project called Berry Predictor, uh, which is led by Berry Gardens. And you can see there our, our partners within that project. And the aims of the project are several fold, but, but for, this, uh, for this purpose, we're really wanting to understand how those different areas within the polytunnel, how the phytoclimate, the, the climate around the plants in the roots and in the canopy, how those differences can uh, explain some of the variability in yields that we're seeing across the production area. So this is a, just a, a schematic of photosynthesis there, the graph on the left, you can see on the x-axis, there's increasing uh, irradiance, so increasing light intensity, and on the y-axis, then we have the photosynthetic rate, also known as the assimilation rate. And essentially, uh, up until a certain point, if you increase the uh, light intensity, you get a corresponding increase in the rate of photosynthesis. And you can see there a linear response at those lower light intensities. Until we get to a point which is called the light saturation point. And so over that light intensity, any further increases in light intensity don't tend to uh, further increase photosynthesis, the rate of photosynthesis plateaus. And so, so having that information is very, uh, very valuable uh, in that, that light saturation point can vary quite significantly between, between varieties. It varies significantly between strawberry and, and raspberry, for example. So, so having that data then helps to make informed decisions about how to optimize the, the light environment to, uh, to really get the best yields from any given variety. And you'll see there the graph on the right. This is just a... Um, a typical day, I think it was the 24th of June last year. And you'll see there the different colors represent the different rows in the polytunnel. So row one, which is on the east, uh, is the blue, <laughs> the blue line there. And you can see the light intensity peaks um, around sort of 10, 11 o'clock and then falls throughout the day. You can perhaps see row four, which is the orange color, which, which tends to have a fairly even distribution of light, of par. And you can see row six there then uh, in the pinky color, which tends to be fairly low in the morning and then peak towards sort of the early, early to mid afternoon. So very different lighting environments uh, in those different rows within the polytunnel. And if we then look at the effect of those lighting environments on photosynthesis, well, this exactly as you would expect, we see higher rates of photosynthesis with, with the higher light intensities. And so the, the graph on the left there is a measure of assimilation rate, so the rate of photosynthesis. And you can see there in, in row uh, one, which is the blue bars, uh, that the rate of photosynthesis tends to peak uh, in the late morning and then gradually decline in the afternoon. You can see a fairly even distribution in row four, and then you can see perhaps a, a peak towards midday and after midday uh, in row six. And so, you know, this matches exactly the sort of the, the light of the, the pile that's falling on 
on the crop. And so it's very important, we think, to, to maximise light interception. But it's not quite so simple as that, because we, uh, we often, coming back to that extra yield in row one, we think that the time at which the light intensity is, is optimum is also important. And you can see here in the graphs on the, on the left-hand side, uh, the top graph on the left there, you can see the red colour, that, that's the par reaching the plant in row one, which is the eastern side of the polyton. So you can see there the, the par tends to peak in the, in the mid to late morning, um, and in the afternoon then you can see then that, that row six comes into play. So, so this is a sort of seasonal pattern um, that sort of reflects the, the diurnal pattern we looked at earlier. So different row positions uh, are sort of receiving different levels of, of par during the day. And it, if we look at uh, the effect of that, so, so Nick Dodrell, who, who many of you will have heard uh, speak before, he's, uh, he's our, our CTP, one of the CTP students, and Nick's done some very good work this year at the Wet Centre looking at how the efficiency of photosynthesis varies throughout the day. And of course, what we tend to see is that, that the efficiency of photosynthesis in row one is highest in the morning and then tends uh, to decline in the afternoon. Uh, and the efficiency of photosynthesis in row four, for example, is, is often higher than the other rows. So, so this sort of really matches everything we've seen in terms of the effects of light intensity on, on yield. And of course, Nick's very interested in investigating the expression of some of those photosynthetic genes and how they change throughout the day and throughout the row position, but also throughout the season. So um, just a couple of then uh, questions to finish with. I hope this doesn't freeze the screen again, but if it does, I think I've only had my, my thank you slide at the end there. So I'll hand back over to you, Scott. Okay. Um, oh. Sorry, Mark, I seem to have stopped it too early. Uh, I was trying to make it work, but I don't know whether people have had a chance to vote. It doesn't look like they have. I don't know if you're able to try that again. OK, so maybe people can, can vote now. OK, looks like everybody's voted, so I'll close that one. Can you see the results, Mark? Yes, I can. Yeah, very clear. <laughs> OK. And you want to move on to the third one? Can you see it, Mark? Uh, no, I've still got the second one at the moment. I, I okay. can't move on to the poll. OK, let's try again. How does that, is that working for you now? Yes, I can see that, yeah. Yeah, OK. So there's a chance for people to vote for question three. Okay. Nothing, nothing coming up there for question three. Oh, you say I have a big pardon. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. So, so yes, obviously trying to do everything we can to maximise light interception is is key to driving those those yields and 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 the high quality. And so uh, there are lots of different things we can uh, try to do. Uh, I think it's probably frozen my screen again, so I'll. Try and come out. Okay, I'll go on to that one. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can, Mark. Okay, so so one of the things we want to try to do to increase light interception by the plants is then is to use smart venting control. So so you'll see there in the photograph we have the uh, the automated vents on the roof, and one thing we're doing in the Innovate UK project then is to develop. Um, AI driven smart venting control to try to optimize the, the growing conditions, which includes the light environment. And you can see there in the, in, in, in the graph, the effect of venting on the, the light availability or the, the PAR 
uh, being intercepted by the canopy. So you can, you can very easily uh, enhance the, the light falling onto the crop, of course, by, by smart venting control. Um, so that might help to raise photosynthetic, uh, raise photosynthesis in the morning and help to support higher yields. Um, but certainly Nick work, Nick's work suggests that because photosynthetic efficiency can sometimes decrease in the afternoon, then just simply raising par in the afternoon may not be uh, sufficient to, um, and to raise yields. So we need to look at perhaps other mechanisms of enhancing photosynthesis then in those west facing rows. So of course, you know, we could, we're looking at independent east and west tunnel venting to see whether that has an effect. Um, there's always the, uh, the option to use light reflective moistures in the leg rows. Um, finally, then some, some new technology that Dan was referring to earlier that we heard about at the Berry Gardens conference last week is, is using sort of nanotechnology, ba nanotechnology based solutions to try to enhance rates of photosynthesis. And so we're, we're quite keen to understand uh, how we can use that technology then to really drive uh, yields up over the uh, entire production system. So uh, out of time now, so just to say thank you to my team at uh, East Marling and also to our farm team and thank the Wet Centre Consortium and also the uh, agronomy advice and the Berry Gardens agronomy team. And then finally, thanks to our Innovate UK project consortium. Thank you, Mark. Um, we have run over a little bit. Sorry, folks. Uh, there are three questions that I'll uh, we just briefly deal with. Uh, one question asking if you could be a little bit clearer as to which of the tunnel types, whether auto venting or standard, had the lower yield. Auto venting say. tunnels had the lower yield. Right. OK, thanks for clarifying that. Uh, Mark, have you measured CO2 in the plant canopy at different times of the day and in the different rows? We haven't measured CO2 concentrations. We're very interested in CO2 enrichment and looking at the effects of, um, so understanding how different varieties respond to raising CO2 concentrations. Uh, so we, we normally carry out routinely ACI curves to give us that information to find out what the optimum uh, internal concentration should be to drive photosynthesis. Uh, and then we're also, uh, we've also done work on CO2 enrichment, but that's an area that, that we certainly want to uh, to, um, to progress over the next couple of years. OK, thank you. Uh, does this take into account thermal dominancy events? Um, not quite sure what that's referring to. No, I'm not sure to. what it refers to. Um, but... Perhaps the difference in difference in yields between the two tunnels. So um, we do see a cooler environment on very hot days in the autoventor tunnels, uh, but we haven't really, over the last few years, we haven't really seen a significant impact of thermal dominancy on on yield. So, but in theory, the you know the, the temperature within the auto venting tunnels is is certainly uh, often lower on on those very hot days than in the commercial tunnels. Okay, uh, and last one: um, Are you looking at the effect of temperatures during the day upon photosynthesis and crop yield? Yes, we are. So, very interested in looking at optimum optimum um, rates of photosynthesis at different temperatures but also the effect of different temperatures on berry expansion, uh, because we know in, in very hot weather, then we get a, a decoupling between the rate of ripening and berry expansion. So we tend to get very ripe fruit that are smaller. So, so it's very uh, important to understand what the, you know, what the relation uh, with temperature is in terms of fruit expansion, uh, but also on ob obviously final yield as well. OK, Mark, we must finish. We have run over, uh, but I'm very grateful to you. Thank you so much indeed to Mark. So uh, let's just close out here. Um, I'm just going to bring us back to uh, my own slide. Just bear with me a second. Um, and I'll bring back the closing slide for you all. There we are. OK, so thank you all, uh, first of all, to all of our presenters um, for being succinct, keeping us to time. Uh, and for being um, for providing us with so much information today. I, I hope you'll agree that by keeping the talk shorter has been uh, more effective and helpful to you all uh, to retain more information. Um, again, a, a reminder about basis and Eroso points. Um, if you want us to register your basis and Eroso points, please do submit your details to lauren.colagiovanni at niab.com. Her address was in the chat earlier on, uh, and we can do that for you. 
And if we, if you feel we haven't satisfied your questions uh, uh, to, to, to a level that you wish, um, do submit any more questions or repeat any questions to me at scott.raffle at ahdv.org.uk and I'll get in touch with the presenters and get them to make contact directly with you. And do remember that recording of today's event has been uh, or will be made available on the NIAB website, www.niab.org.uk. Dot com. And finally, thank you to all of you for uh, taking the time to tune in. I hope you've benefited um, from some or all of the presentations today. Um, it's wonderful to have you with us and we hope to see you again soon when we do our next webinar. So in the meantime, thank you very much to everyone and all our speakers and uh, we wish you well. Thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>